Well, we are so excited to have Jen Seen on. She is a pediatric sleep consultant, a postpartum doula, and mom of three. Wow. She's passionate about happy families, helping families, and finding sustainable sleep solutions for everyone. I love that. She talks a lot about realistic expectations and how to handle ideal sleep strategies, but in real life. I love that last part in real life because this isn't just something, you know, for social media. This is what really is going to work yeah. for us. So welcome, Jen Seed. We are so glad to have you here. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. So let's go ahead and ask Jen Seed our very first question. And, and if you guys think of any questions, I don't really see the chat in the live. Sometimes I do. But if you have a question and you're on the live, feel free to ask a question and we'll, we'll try to get to it, if not during the live after. So this first question is about common sleep challenges. So what are the most common sleep challenges you see in toddlers? Now, when, when I say toddlers, it doesn't it can include the transition from baby to toddler. I feel like that eight, you know, somewhere around that six to eight months to one years old, there's, you know, there's a transition there, but there's also a transition around two and then three. So there's so many, but what are the most common sleep challenges that you are seeing yourself? Yeah. When I was thinking about this question, I was thinking really more of that, like kind of that in between or like, 15 to 18 months, maybe even a little bit of an older toddler, um, which would be like crossing the preschooler, I guess, like moving to a bed. Um, typically what I find is at this toddler age, either trying to crawl out of the crib is a very big one and parents like aren't ready for it and it just happens. And then there's like a reactive, like, oh my goodness, we have to get to other bed, like do all these things or that transition move to a bed like you have a plan and you know you're going to do it but then that transition to move to the bed can be really tricky too around two there's usually a nap regression which is super fun to panic that that's the end of naps so that that gets a little bit tricky too because we all love our nap time we all love to have that built-in break in the middle of the day so to think that that might be going away is, is a really kind of scary thought at two years old 100%. We went through one of those phases where my toddler boys were not sleep taking their nap. And I was like, oh, are they like this early? Like I thought we had till maybe like three or four, but they're only two. And uh, it turned out, no, there's they're sleeping three hour naps right now. It turned out, no. And if I think if we would have been like given up on it, they we may have had a different schedule, but we were like, and, and it is so funny what you say about the crawling out of the crib, because, um, yeah, I feel like that will probably be my voice, like overnight, they're going to like figure it out. And it's just will be like chaos for us. So <laughs> what are some steps we can take if, if we get into these situations? And it's like one of those overnight crisis type things. I think for the naps, it's good to know that Typically naps don't end until between three and five. So the fact that you were kind of like, I don't know, like it could go either way. The fact that you probably stuck with the naps and continue to offer them. Now you see on the back end, like three hour nap is a very substantial nap. That's something that you want to do away with just, you know, because they definitely still need it. For the crib, I try to, or even for the naps, I try to have everything continue for at least a week and see, okay, is this just a one-time thing or is this something that's actually lasting me to make a change? So with the naps, you continue to offer them day after day, at least for a week. If you see any improvement, then like, yes, let's continue on this path and keep it going. Same thing for the crib. It could be, I have a lot of families that are like, they crawled out last night and like, now they're in a bed and what do we do? I'm like, that was like four hours ago. Like, how did you even have the time just to just like do all of this stuff? So we want to just like kind of take in what did we do? How did we react? What did they do when we had that reaction? And now let's continue forward kind of as normal. But if we do after the week, like you are getting hurt in the other crib or I'm not able to, you know, turn the crib around first or lower the mattress or whatever it may be. 
then we need to make a change. But try not to have any um, like fast reactions to things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like, like grip onto that and you're like, oh, okay, that worked. And then they are gonna keep kind of pushing those boundaries, pushing those buttons to see if we're gonna continue to go down this new path, which might be something more fun, AKA more playing because they're not napping or something that like, you know what? I thought that's what I wanted, but actually I can't handle this. And I do really need that nap back. And I do really want my crib back because this big wide room is just too much for me. Yeah, and, and that's an interesting point you bring up too, not just for the parents, but for the child himself. And they're like, they're in a routine. It's what they're used to. And even if they did do something like fall out of the crib one time, it's still, it's going to be different. We know like if we split sleep in a different bed or a different way that it can throw us off, we might not get as good of a sleep and kind of be on edge or, yeah. You at a hotel, you know, everything like, it's nice here and it's comfortable, but it's just not your bed. Like I can sleep, but it's not, I know the difference between like my routine and my home and my bed versus this, you know, other kind of strange place. Yes. And I, I think this is, we've reached a very interesting milestone with my twins that they'll be three years old in June. So just a few months away. And one of them is, he tells me he wants to go take a nap and he says, go upstairs. He's like looking for his lovey mm -hmm. he has, and he's like, go nap. Yeah. <laughs> it's like before, it's like I had to convince them to do that. Now it's like, go nap. And, and then they don't, I doesn't want to read a book. Just put me in the crib and turn the lights <laughs> off and fine. <laughs> like, it's a new phase we're in right now. I, isn't it? And not yeah. like as an adult, that's us too. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, yeah, I'm tired. <laughs> Love to go take a nap. So just yes. like, internalize it. Like, this is what my body needs is so amazing because you offered that container for them to be able to feel comfortable and confident to go rest their bodies when they need it. And sometimes like, you know, they don't know what they don't know, but once it's been offered in a particular way and it's part of their routine, then it just makes them feel so much more comfortable and confident to do what their body is like asking of them instead of trying to fight it and like, no, I don't want a nap, even though their eyes are clearly closed and they're like laying on the floor yeah. trying to still play, but it's not working out. <laughs> so true. I, I love how you're you're helping support their confidence too, the the children. And so let's talk about some customized sleep strategies. So every toddler is unique and baby as well. Can you share how you think about or tailor some of the sleep strategies for individual children's needs and maybe their different temperaments? Yeah, it's definitely going to depend on, I mean, there are some kind of like universal truths of things that are just every toddler will benefit from this. Then there's also other things that we have to take into account. Like, do you have younger or older siblings? Do you go to a nursery school that's half day? Do you, you know, what, whatever it may be, do you live in a one bedroom or a studio apartment? That's going to look different from a family that has like a five bedroom home. So there really has to be, I just got off the phone with my mom. Her child has apraxia. So language development is really difficult for her. And she like, we need to help facilitate that as a way for her to feel comfortable and confident at bedtime where if she's really upset, she can't get any words out. I mean, that just leads to frustration for everybody. So there's always going to be kind of this like basic, like, here you go. But then there has to be other things that we pull in because just every child is so different. Every family is so different. Your goals are different. What this mom that I just talked to might want ideally from her schedule is going to be different from what you might want from your boys. You have twins. That's definitely going to be a lot different from this other child over here. So <laughs> There has to be that, that has to be considered in any sleep plan because there's just so many things that, that come into play around sleep and around just family dynamics as a whole. I love how you said also, you mentioned all the different dynamics like daycare, there, th those can be changes in routine that somebody whose child doesn't do that might have to encounter or siblings or like you said, twins, like two. So when you're 
when they're transitioning from the crib to a bed, it's like, it's not one child in that room, it is two children. Or if you have a baby and a toddler or you have an older kid, like that changes so much. So I, I love how you, you think about all of those different ways to help families, no matter how different they are. I love that. And even um, little, I'm in New England, so yeah. years and snowboarders. So what is your weekend? What do your weekends look like? Do you go mm, all weekend? That's going to be a very different conversation of like your child's doing ski lessons when typically they would be napping. So we have to, or by the, like, go to the beach. You have a beach house. What is that going to look like on the weekends? Because I don't want it to ever feel like we have to create this perfect sleep bubble. Because again, back to the very beginning when you were saying like, I'm more realistic about the expectations. There is no perfect sleep bubble. <laughs> that just doesn't, there's not going to be two weeks where you can just like have this perfect environment and your child naps exactly at this time to this time. And like bedtime is always at this time because that's just not life. So we need to find out how can we have these strategies, but also like you can live your life and you're not feeling like you can never leave the house or you can never have a dinner out because your baby has to be in bed by this time. That's so true. And even if we have the intention to be on schedule and time, it, it, you know, your, your kids are having a fun time. It's a beautiful day. You're like, this is life right here. Like we, we're not going to go home early. And then, yeah, they might fall asleep in the car. They might make it home. You don't know. You might get home an hour or two later than what you planned. And that definitely is the real part of it is when you do have plans, it's, it, it, it can be very hard to leave at a certain time. Maybe your kids got hungry. And so there was an extra snack or meal or something and you're out and now everything is pushed back. So totally real life. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about some kind of uh, sleep regressions and nighttime waking for toddlers. Now, I know that, that this can happen. Like for us, a lot of it in the past was some of it was like teething back, you know, and maybe around between the age of one and two for our toddlers, every toddler's different. If they got their teeth on the earlier side, even when they were babies, they were starting to get teeth in. And so we had, you know, teething for a long while. Um, and we had a lot of night wakings. We also had like anytime there was like a sleep regression, we always felt it early. So if it was like the two year sleep regression, you know, we were feeling it a few months before and everything with um, our toddlers has been that way. And I know everyone is different, but what are some gentle yet effective methods for helping toddlers sleep through the night, whether it's like a a regression or some other kind of a nighttime waking maybe they're having dreams or you know who knows what exactly it is yeah so it's gonna depend on kind of like what's going on um consistency is still gonna be something that you're gonna want to offer because a lot of children don't well no child relates like oh i'm teething and that's why now i get to sleep in mom or dad's bed or mm -hmm. i'm sick and now like and they slept on my floor and they held me all night. And like that, that was really fun. So I'm going to kind of push for that. So as much as you can stay consistent through those regressions, it's going to help, but also kind of knowing what the, what the, the thing behind it is. So is it developmental? Are they now, depending on the age, like if they're one, are they now going to stand and learn to cruise? That's going to have a different response in the middle of the night than a child that is two and now, well, actually it'd be the same response if they're two and like starting to put two words together um but that's gonna have a different response than if they're sick so kind of knowing like the underlying like what is going on were they were we out and about all day and you know what they really didn't drink as much water as they typically do so maybe this night weekend is because they're thirsty um maybe they've been working really really hard to pull to stand and now i look and they're they're standing and they're cruising around their crib and they're stuck and they can't get back down that's gonna have a different response you know so it's really kind of find that underlying factor in addressing that while keep, keeping consistency overall so even if you are going to pull to stand i'm not going to change bedtime routine bedtime routine are going to be the same time do the same things and then if you are stuck in the middle of the night, I'll go in, provide that little bit of support, 
but then still leave the room to have you fall asleep on your own, just as you did at the beginning of the night. So it's really kind of trying to find that identifying factor of what's going on and how can I be there and give support without doing it for you. And I think that that's a big thing, especially in toddler life of like, I do it. <laughs> My two-year-old's favorite thing to say, I do. <laughs> they do. <I'm> like, <laughs> I need to help you put your diaper on like that's we're not quite there yet so anything that we can like understand what's happening help facilitate that but also give them some autonomy over it is going to help in the long run so they know someone is there to help me if i need it but also i can feel empowered to figure it out a little bit on my own i love that and another thing that that we go through is, and I think we touched upon it earlier, was dropping naps. So maybe we had three naps and then we went to two or two naps to one um, and that transition period as well. And so if moms are are not sure, because I know often it's like, you know, as parents, we're all different. Maybe we're like, okay, I'm not ready for that one. Because I've, I've heard this before from parents, like I'm not ready for one nap yet. I don't want to let go of the two naps or and I was in the camp of one nap, this is amazing <laughs> camp, uh, but everybody's in a different camp, what works for them and, but also for their children. So like, yeah, how do we navigate that? Is it, is it really, is it, is it mom or parent led and baby toddler led, or should it really be coming from the child lead us and we are going to facilitate what they need? Yeah. Typically. I like everything to be child-led because they're going to give us very clear signs where they're fighting that last nap. They're taking mm -hmm. a really long fall asleep at bedtime. They're waking up earlier in the morning. Those signs are going to tell us we do need to make some changes in your schedule. And most likely it's going to be dropping or consolidating naps or whatever it may be. Sometimes we do have to like, we do have to kind of push it. One example of it being adult led would be in childcare. You, I know I'm in Massachusetts. Um, they, when ch children move from the infant room to the toddler room at 12 months, they move them onto one nap. And that's okay. really early for a lot of children. You said 12 months? Oh, wow. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. They move from wow. a nap at 10 or like kind of their own schedule to yeah. one. Yeah with everybody around like 12, 12, 15. So that's when you get those adorable pictures of your baby like falling asleep on in the high chair with like pasta all over their face. Cute, but like also a little sad because your yeah. baby was so, couldn't even make it through their lunch. So sometimes there's reasons that like a lot of families will say, okay, my, my child is going to move into this room. Should I, how should I prep them to know that one nap is coming? So sometimes we don't want to be a huge shock to their system. So we do do some like adult led prepping, knowing that this transition is coming. Um, but it depends on the child. If they're unable to do it, then I'll say, okay, let's just split it. Their day's home, they're doing two naps, their days at daycare, especially if it's like two or three days, we'll do the one nap. But we need them to catch up on that sleep the other days that they are home. So most of the time I like it to be child led, Sometimes they need a little like, like boost <laughs> to be able to understand and, and to gain the new skill or whatever it may be. But it's kind of like, it's kind of like walking. Your child is showing that they're ready. They're stand, they're pulling to stand. They're letting go. They're balancing. But we're, we're kind of facilitating it. We put them up. We'll like give them our hands. We'll walk them around. So it's your child is showing interest, but then we're like helping them along the way so it's not just a com complete like i'm not gonna i'm not even gonna acknowledge that you're pulling to stand like no you're gonna see it and you're gonna try to facilitate it and you're gonna hold their hand while they walk around and all of that so i think it, it's a little bit of a mix of the two but you definitely want to make sure your child is ready before you just jump into a new sleep situation okay so if there are moms that are feeling um they're just feeling a little worried or stressed about whatever stage it is. How can, or do you have any tips that can empower moms to feel more confident or capable in handling their sleep challenges or, or going forward and, and following their child's lead on their needs when, when 
appropriate or when it makes sense. Like I know we just talked about a scenario where toddlers were um, being put to bed at noon, so that that affected the family, and obviously that's going to change things. But if it's not something like that, and you are able to to follow your child's lead um, based off your own family schedule, yeah, what are some ways to help empower moms uh, to feel more confident in through these these periods of time? Yeah, I think it's really just like trusting your gut. Um, I have one mom in particular. I worked with her daughter. She's now three, and she will t- text me like. She just did this. What do I do? And I'm like, what do you think that you should do? That you should do? You know, because I think it's it's in us, and we second guess. And even if our first instinct might not go well or might not benefit our child, like I think it's still really important to just trust ourselves and to know um, I'm the person that knows my baby best. And if I think that this is the right thing in the moment, that's the thing that I'm going to follow through with. And then maybe with new information and new data, that wasn't the way that I want to continue to go. And now I switch it up. So I think there's no, I don't have any like tactile tools to take away, but I think it's just really just feel out what's right for you. And and I love how you say trust the gut and what works for you. And I love how you have that growth mindset of, you know, if you see more information, it's okay to pivot and change a little bit. If you get new information or you have new insights, maybe you had a conversation with your your marriage partner or yeah. um, and you and you've realized, hey, actually we should try this and it's okay. We you know, we don't and I always say this like we don't have to be perfect parents. We're just we're doing the best we can at the yeah. time and so is our child. <laughs> like, yes, yes. Oh yes, we are yeah. It's even I always joke I told my parents like you paid for me to get a master's degree so I could be like a super mom. My dad was like, I'm not paying for that. I said, well, you are. Cause that's why like I knew I wanted to be a mom forever. So even with all of that, it's still, I'm doing the best I can with the knowledge that I have. And it's surprising how much that textbook knowledge like doesn't translate over <laughs> into real life. Thing. Like child development is my thing. I studied it deeply but now it's just it's so different from like reading in a textbook and actually applying it to a real life child who's running and screaming and awake and all of those good things I love the the difference that you've noticed there and and that I also noticed those parallels as well because I was a teacher and then and then you know in my specialized in behavior and then now I help parents with their toddler's behavior and meltdowns, but and I and I noticed a very similar parallel and even kind of like a growth mindset of just like now that I'm a parent, mm-hmm. I would have done this differently, um, and maybe in the classroom. So it, it, it's, yes. it's we're always growing and learning, and and I think if, you know when we embrace that, we can really be open to what's best for our family and for our child. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I think that's really important. It could be like what you do and say for one twin may be different than what you do and say for the other. So it's even, it's crazy. Even like, I don't know if they're, all, but like from the same egg, like your parents yeah. play differently. So it's funny just how big the differences can be. So true. So true. Yeah. And so I feel like this is kind of a, an interesting thing is that, you know, I feel like, and I hope I, it's okay that I, talk about this, but I do feel like more now than ever, and I love how you said trusting the gut instinct, but more now than ever, I see online, social media, guilting and shaming moms for their the decisions that they have made that they thought was best for their family at the time, or maybe still think it is the best choice that they had made, whether it was sleep training their, their children or whatever other choices, right? And I'm just seeing a lot of this. And I feel like this is kind of an interesting thing to talk about that, that, you know, is, is easy to talk about like passively through typing on like a keyboard or texting on a phone, like, you know, you did this, you know, da, 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 you're this, or that's terrible, or how could you do this to your child? Or, and I think like the, there's like a, an amount of compassion and empathy that is really, that I don't know that I wish we could kind of bring back because like when I, when you just mentioned like, yeah, 
I had twins, you know, sleep was not something that was happening. And to share like a personal story, there was one point because we did do, we did work with our toddlers between six and seven months on sleep training. We did that. We did a certain method. And so, but before that, you know, I was getting so little sleep. Um, there was one time where we were living at my parents' house because we were in a transitional mood. And one morning, I think they were maybe three months old. I did not wake up and they were crying and mm -hmm. I slept through it. And my mom came in the room and she was like, so surprised. She's like, how would you not hear that? I was out ah. and I don't think I would have woke up. It was just the compounded amount of lack of sleep over time, months, and, and probably before the, the boys were born. Because when you a twin pregnancy, you're so big, you're not sleeping. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I did not wake up and she, she woke me up. And I, I was like, I wouldn't, if, if it was just me in this house I, and my husband was at work, because th this was during COVID and everything was totally different then. But uh, if it was now, I, I would not have woke up. And that is... And that's why, like, one of the reasons why I was like, I really need sleep. And yeah. I feel like some families that will make a decision that's best for them. Like, by all means, I think if you're not for something, your gut says that something isn't right for your kids or for you, I think you should listen to it. If it's wrong mm -hmm. for you, you should listen to that. But on the other end, I think if it is right for you, you should listen to it because I feel like marriages could fall apart because of lack of sleep. Oh. Um, and if we're bringing these things on, like not just through the, the baby stages, but we're bringing it into toddlerhood where still not sleeping, the, the effect of the lack of sleep on the family and on the, the, the children because all their neural pathways are forming and getting all this constant broken yeah. sleep. Uh, it's just, you know, it's like, it's like we have to weigh what's best for our family. I don't know. What are your thoughts on some of those, oh. those things? I completely agree. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think it's, yeah, it's, you have to trust what is best for you. And if getting more sleep is what you need, then that's the way forward, whether, and it doesn't have to be, you could do it a different way. Like maybe you and your neighbor both decide to sleep train, but one of you does complete cry it out. And one of you does a gentle stay in the room method. The end result is the same. You're both getting more sleep, but the way that you went about it was the way that was best for your family. And I think yes. even the flip side of this, I had a family once that this colleague really sticks out and I still always think about it because she, I asked her, you know, what's going on. And she was explaining what was happening with her child. And like, she was explaining that they were co-sleeping and this was happening and that was happening, but it didn't, it wasn't a pain point. She wasn't upset about it. And I said, how does this feel to you? And she said, it feels fine. I said, Okay, well, can I ask you, like, why you called? <laughs> like, if everything's <laughs> going well, like, I don't, maybe your baby's waking up multiple times a night, but you seem okay with that. And she said, well, my sister told me that I had to call you because I should be sleep training. And I said, well, do you want to? She said, no. I said, okay, I'm, I fully give you permission to just hang up on me. Like, I don't want you to do something because somebody else says that you have to be doing it. If you were completely happy and content with your sleep situation don't fix it because somebody else tells you that you have to i really want to be here for those families that are like i yes this isn't working for us. maybe it was working for us now i'm deciding it's no longer working for us and i want to find another path forward i'm not here to say if your baby is over four months and they're waking it all at night then you know they need to be sleeping like that's just yeah. not <laughs> that's just not helpful for anybody so I think it's really just what it, thinking about like your ideal, I always say, if you can wave a magic wand, what would your ideal sleep situation look like? And if that is what is happening now, then you don't need support. If you feel like you're so far away from where that is, then yeah, having the support is really going to be helpful to just kind of fast track that from point A to point B, instead of kind of having to like stumble along it alone, because you don't want to. You don't want to waste more time and energy that you already don't have to be able to like piece these things together, figure it out. You want, you want the answer. You want direct, you know, direct from A to B. Don't, what is the Monopoly thing? Like, don't pass go. I never played Monopoly, but whatever that like thing is. Um, yeah, to get you there. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. And like, here's another interesting 
interesting example is, you know, and like the next question I want to ask you is about like avoiding common pitfalls or like what are some things that we do when we're working on with our, our babies or toddlers to sleep, how to avoid them. And I would like to share a story if that's okay. Yeah, so one of my, so as we said, I have twins and their, their personalities are completely different. They're identical twins, however. And one of them, so I, I learned about this thing called like, um, like an in-between sleep cycle where they're connecting sleep cycles. And sometimes this does happen during their nap because they nap for a long time. And so I used to go, you know, I used to go get him so he would cry. I would go get him right away. And he, he would literally be, I'd take him downstairs so his brother could keep sleeping. And he would literally be screaming for an hour like so mad, so frustrated. He said, go to bed, but there was no going back to bed at that point because his stress was just through the roof. And I learned if I just just let, he, he, you know, he cries a little for five minutes and he goes back to sleep. I get him. He's totally happy. And that it, it was not worth that hour of screaming and stress. Um, and you know, it, 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 it can be hard for us because it's like, yeah, we all oh, he's crying. I want to go get him. But in this situation, I have learned oh, the consequence of that is is not actually what's best for him. Yeah. And, you know, if another baby, it could be what was best for them. But for this particular <laughs> boy, it's not not the right plan. Right. But what uh, and that. You know, and a lot of parents might not be aware of connecting sleep cycles or things like that. So what are some common pitfalls that you do see when parents are trying to help their support their toddlers in a loving way to sleep? Uh, how can we avoid them? Yeah, I think one big one is like we want to fix it for them. And this is a hard like as my oldest son is six and like I'm learning to have to let go like little by little. I think this is a hard, like, this is one of those first things that, like, we kind of as parents have to start to step back a little bit and, like, that they can do these things and get these skills and whatever it may be. So I think trying to not always fix everything, but being there to, like, facilitate and support them, I think, is is one of the things. The consistency, I think, is a big one, too. That is that is definitely the biggest pitfall that I see, that another mom that I'm working with now, she, we just ended and she said, this is the longest that I've ever been consistent with something because she would read something online, try it for a night. It didn't work. She'd read something online the next day, try that that night. It didn't work. So having this plan of just, I do this on this night and then I continue to do this maybe a little bit differently on this night. And then just staying with it is, is the biggest thing. Sometimes we try to we try to fix it too fast and okay. it's working right away. Then we're like, Oh, we need something else. But it's like, well, we just, we didn't even know what was happening that first night. Now we need like another night and another night, another night to really like solidify and understand what you're asking me to do. So I think that's definitely the biggest pitfall is just hoping for a change too fast. And we just, you know, want to be slow. We want to be the, the tortoise, not the hare. I want to be able to see. <laughs> I don't know where they're coming from. That's like kind of if we, you know, we start working out one day and we didn't work out and be like, okay, I'm not seeing, re I'm not seeing the results. And it's only been one day. And maybe in a week you would see a result. I mean, that's soon, but you might, but one day, one time. Ah. So it's like just knowing that, yeah, to stay consistent because like you said, that could be not just confusing and stressful for the family, but for the child too, always changing up. They never have any idea, like, what are you going to do? Is tonight a night that you're deciding cry it out and you're just going to leave me in here alone? But then the next night you come in and you're here, you're just staying by my bed. <laughs> and I don't know why you're doing that. And I'm just yeah. going to watch you because I have no idea why you're sitting in here. And then the next night you, like, are coming in and out. So I'm going to cry when you leave because are you coming back in or are you not coming back in? So really, like. The, the first night that you make a change is going to be hard for everyone. You're going to feel a little, even if you're confident in like, yes, we're going to make this change. It's still not going to be second nature. It's going to be something where you're second guessing like, oh, did I do that right? Let me look at my plan. Let me do this. And your baby is just like, or your toddler is just like, I don't know what's happening. 
<laughs> I'm going to go with this, but like, I have no idea what you're doing. And then once you keep doing the same thing over and over, they understand, they respond well, they feel comfortable and confident because they know exactly how you're going to react to things. But if we're changing it up too fast, then that just, it leads to insecurity and it leads to less sleep for everyone. Yes, and toddlers love consistency. They love predictability. So that is something else that, 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 that they need to get into. They need to feel it. And Huge creatures it's important. Bad. Yes. Even when, safe. like, when parents move from a crib to a toddler bed, I say, put that bed in the exact location as the crib. Like, don't, don't try to get fancy and, like, move the room around do everything fun. Like, like, you need to have everything the exact same way because they will walk into that room, notice it's different, and just shut down because they don't, like, they just weren't expecting it. It was, it's too much change, even though it feels like fun and new. And look at this big, huge bed you have now on the other side of the room. And they're like, no, I like, this is what I looked at when I fell asleep. This is what I did. This is where I laid. So as much as you can keep the same, that's, they're going to feel really good about it. I love how that is an amazing tip. So I'm going to write that one down. <laughs> and thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that. It's, it's amazing what we don't think of that really does can make a difference for them transitioning. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to remember that one. Well, yeah. Oh. If you're all, like if you left the, the room that you're in right now and you came back tonight and everything was different, the pictures were in different places, your desk was in a like basic way. They're like, what is this? Like, <laughs> this is really weird. You know, like somebody's you, playing a joke like, <laughs> And you would probably be, and for toddlers, I would think they'd be more stimulated by the fact that it's different and like there's more to figure out or explore about it because it's even more different than it would have been. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. I know. It's so, sometimes it's hard to relate to them as like little us, you know, like putting us in their shoes. It's like, well, how would I react to this? If I walked in and something was completely different, I, if my spouse sometimes talk, talk to me and sometimes didn't and sometimes come in the room when I talk to them and sometimes just completely ignore me like that wouldn't be a very stable relationship to view so you know we we want to create that same trust and respect for our toddlers too I love that so Jensine would you share some of your success stories, either if it is your own family and your own children or uh, some of your clients with how you helped improve their their babies or toddler sleep and the improvement in the family's overall, overall well-being. Yeah, let me think. So I have a, I had a family, this was a couple of years ago now. She, they lived across the country from me. They're in like somewhere in the Midwest. And they, the daughter had never slept through the night. They had an older son and the daughter was about two and she had never slept through the night in her entire life. And the mom was just like, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I need some help. So we had actually talked when she was one and she said, you know what? I think I'm going to figure it out. And then she came back to me a year later and said, I still haven't figured it out. I need some help. So we dove in. She was at that point in a bed and they had some really like set in family routines. There was something they would go outside and like, they had this like howl at the moon thing, which was a neighborhood. Like everyone would come out of their house at the same time and like, look at the moon. And it was just like a, a nice like gathering. I can't remember exactly what it was. It was something like they howled at the moon or something like that. But it was like after I would typically recommend bedtime to be. So we had to adjust some things to really say, okay, this is something that's important to you and your family. How can we, how can we change things around? So. We did a little bit of a later bedtime, but we were able to fudge it with a little bit of a later nap or a little bit of a later morning and a little bit of an earlier nap. So it worked. And she went from no nap or rest time to, and waking up multiple times a night to sleeping through the night and then getting back into a routine of to sometimes do quiet time, sometimes nap. So it was like the mom was ecstatic. She had her own business. So she was like, I can work. I can do yoga in the morning. I can sit and drink my hot coffee. Like she just was in disbelief that she had waited all this time trying to figure it out. And she's like, two weeks after working with you, everything has changed. And like, our life is so much different. So that was a really, 
that howl of the moon part like always <laughs> stands out because it's just i would never heard of it i they were in like i want to say wisconsin or something i don't know michigan it was some some i don't know if that's like anybody watching that like knows that and that's like a a common thing but yeah that was that was a fun because it's like okay how do we make this work with like a, a later bedtime but we were able to do it wow that's that's amazing. I love I love that and how that she waited a year, but as soon as she, that she got support, it was figured out in in two weeks. And she must have been really relieved and really glad and that she was getting her child was getting naps and all that and sleeping and that that's incredible. And and I do feel like sometimes like it is like like yeah, the nap does it need to be pushed back? Does it need to be you know, what needs to be changed because they're not sleeping at night or, and it can be these things. And when we're so tired, we're, we're trying to balance all these things where, you know, we have like all these blind spots and we're not able to always think of, yeah, oh, it, if we did these things and it takes somebody else that is obviously qualified like you, who especially knows how to customize and what's appropriate because we can end up just going and, you know, Google and trying to find answers and trying things not working, trying to figure it out. And sometimes it can work for some, but for others it doesn't. And that's when it's it's okay to get help on things. I know in my life, the times that I did get help on things, you know, I those are one of some of the best decisions that I made. Yeah. 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 No, that that's the thing. I think it's just sometimes accepting that like we don't know it all and like we can't know yeah. it all oftentimes with families there's not i don't come in and i'm like oh wow we have to scrap everything because this is all like i've never told a family they're doing anything wrong but like we need to take out everything you're doing and like implement everything new it's usually like oh okay let's do this let's move this here and it's very small changes but they make the biggest impact because what google can't do is like you might put in a big over like toddler wakes up after 20 minutes of a nap but they don't know about their feeding schedule or they don't know that four days a week you have to wake them to pick up an older sibling at school or you know so some of those nuances i can see the entire picture and be able to give a more tailored strategy where google can only answer like the direct thing that you're googling it's not seeing the other pieces that may not look like they're they would factor in, but they actually do and like are a big factor in whatever the issue is. Hundred percent, that is so true, and 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 I've noticed that you know the same thing. You know, if if talk, talking to somebody and they're they're not sharing or thinking or giving information, well, you know, they're struggling, for example, with behavior. Um, and they did not give the information that there was a toddler that was kicked out of their daycare for behavior issues that perhaps their, their child was maybe picking up on some of these behaviors. If, if there's things that are missing from, from the puzzle that, that we haven't put together, and a lot of times, you know, parents won't put them together. I don't understand why my kid is doing this at the playground. I don't understand why he's throwing things at other kids, but then as you, talk about it get get into it you know the, the, it, it surfaces that oh there was this issue with daycare with another child was doing these things it's like oh and and i think that it's again we're so busy that when we dedicate time to really think through with the support of somebody that that can can guide us we can really get to those get to those things that we maybe didn't realize it's like oh that makes sense yeah that's that's part of the equation now this change it shifts everything and that's why it's customized right it's like you are helping babies and toddlers sleep and it's customized to their family there's many different dynamics yeah yeah that's exactly it well thank you so much, Jensine. Is there anything else you would like to share with us? And also, where can we find you? Where can our listeners find you to learn more? Yeah, Instagram would probably be the best at baby O and I. Other than that, yeah, I 
or my website, bbonisconsulting.com. Those are going to be two great places to find me. But I love chatting with people on Instagram. So if you hear this and you want to pop over and have a question or anything like that, that's definitely the place to come and ask it. Thank you so much, Jantine. I really appreciate it. We know that every toddler and baby is different. While some strategies, like some kind of sleep strategies, work for maybe a lot of babies, some babies they don't work for based off of scientific research and data. You, you know, your child could be that small percent that doesn't respond to certain sleep strategies. And it's really important to have somebody in your corner that is looking through all of your family dynamics all of the, the your schedule, your family traditions, and really keeping your values at heart and supporting everybody in your family, family have happy life, good sleep. So thank you, Jensine. Really appreciate all your amazing insights today. And it was a pleasure talking to you. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. All right. Thank you. Bye, Jensine.